I'm James Wright and welcome to the shop. Today we are starting the project of making a tote and so I've been wanting to do something like this for a long time. We're actually going to be turning this into a class so you can join along with me and build in your own shop. We'll be taking this step by step over the next uh, four to six weeks depending upon how far we get and what questions come along. So the idea behind this is you can get the plans and follow along specifically. Uh, put it up in your shop and if you run into things as you're doing it with me, you can ask questions just like in a, a live classroom. We can do it there. Oh, sorry, did I for, did switch off the keyboard? It sounded super loud when I started typing. <laughs> <laughs> it um, to stealth mode. Yes, um, so if you want plans for this, there is a link right down below in the description where you can see those. Um, and we are going to be making this out of some really simple things. So I have a one by four that I was able to get from the big box store and I have this in alder. Um, I'm probably going to be making it in oak later on, um, but for tonight we're gonna to be working with alder. So you're gonna need one one by four that's four foot long. You're gonna need one one by six that's four foot long. And the actual dimensions of this are five and a half by three quarters of an inch. And this one, they are three and a half by three quarters of an inch. And then you're also going to need one three quarter inch dowel that's three foot long. And we're going to be bending it. Um, I just don't have a, uh, an unbent one right now. Uh, so tonight, the goal is we're going to do a, a quick run through of what all we're going to be doing in this. And then we're going to start working on the sides and cutting out the two end caps. Um, so what we'll be doing is we'll be, today we'll be doing the sides and end cap. Next time, we're probably going to start working on doing the dovetailing between the sides and end cap uh, because that's one of the things that really confuses a lot of people. Mm, it's on an angle. How do you do angled dovetails? Um, there's a little trick to that, which makes them really, really simple. <laughs> uh, then the next time, we're going to be resawing the bottom and talking about tuning the bottom. Now, in the video, I actually glued up the bottom. Um, and I'm going to be talking about a couple different ways of not gluing it up. And the reason I did that is I wanted to show it for the, the, test, um, the test design. But there are ways you don't have to glue it up or you can do a tongue and groove. And there's, there's a couple different options for that. Um, but uh, we'll be covering that as well. And then in this one, there is a divider in here. Some people like the divider. Some people don't like the divider. So if you like this, great. We'll be doing a video about shaping that out and cutting the groove and dados for that. We'll have another video where we are then bending the bow and drilling the ends and attaching the handle. The nice thing about this is it's all designed that there are pins through the handle on the end. So everything is held together with that. So with one piece, you can build this all without any glue. Um, if you want to add glue, great, but uh, it is designed to be built without any glue. Um, I forgot to tell you, babe, if someone asks a question that's pertinent to the project while I'm working on it, stop me so I can answer those questions. If it's a general question, then just save Do it for I the end. Do I get to throw a tortilla at you to get you to stop? <laughs> There's a lot of things going on between me and you. Um, so uh, just a couple <laughs> things about uh, events coming up. Um, in two and a half weeks, on the 31st and the 1st, is the Peach Meet down in Georgia. It's just east of Atlanta, Georgia, in Madison. Um, and this is the biggest tool sale in all of the South. So if you are in Georgia, Alabama, uh, Tennessee, South Carolina, even Florida, if you're anywhere around there, this, people are traveling from all around in those states to get to this. I'm even coming all the way from Illinois down. Um, so definitely worth taking a look at. If you want to find out more, I have a link to it down below. You do have to be a member of the MWTCA, um, but you can do that and you can actually sign up when you arrive on the day. So if you want to see that, look at the information down below. And I'm looking forward to meeting you. I'm probably going to be doing a meetup, but I haven't, uh, haven't actually planned that out yet. So um, a couple things coming up. We have a few projects that I'm working on in the shop that I've had some questions about. So a little update. Oh, oh, <laughs> look at that. Now that, that there is pretty. Uh, so this is what I've been working on. I was over with Hand Tools Rescue working on this. And yes, it is not bright orange, but it is not original black either. So I've got a little bit more work to do this and I've got to, I've got to make one little piece uh, right here so I can connect this gear to this gear. Um, and that'll be the first project I'll actually make that. Uh, then let's move over here. And this is another slab top that I got from Matt Cremona. And this will be one of the two desks that we're working on. So that's starting to come up. And then way over there is the most gorgeous girl ever to exist. Look at that. She's a little she fuzzy. Hot? Yeah, that just makes sure. I always wear oh, PJs we to the wrong live. <laughs> I'm like, he's not going to point the camera this way. Um, <sighs> so I've got those coming up. And then I've had a lot of questions about these boxes over here. Because in here I have 16 different chisels from 
uh, very high end. Oh, I kicked it. Sorry. Let's go over here. I have 16 chisels from the very high end to the cutting edge um, cryo steel to the cheap Harbor Freight and the ones you can get in the big box store. And we're going to be doing a chisel test. Now I've had a bunch of people say, why are you doing a chisel test? Everyone out there and their dog has done a chisel test. The problem is I have not yet found an objective chisel test. One that completely eliminates the, yeah, this cuts really well, or uh, this crushes the fiber. I want to put numbers to everything. And I found a jig that actually will test sharpness. So I can say this chisel is a six sharp and this chisel is a 12 sharp and this chisel is an eight sharp. And I can actually test what they are before the work and then after the work, as well as how many strokes on the stone does it take to get from this sharpness to this sharpness. So it'll be an incredibly accurate objective test with 16 different chisels covering the broad range of spectrums from makers. Um, so this is one I've been really, really excited about. And I'm actually going to be working with uh, uh, Tay Tools. Um, he's supplying some of the chisels and uh, he sells all sorts of different hand, uh, all sorts of different uh, woodworking tools. Um, and so it's been kind of a project going back and forth between me and him to make this work. So I'm really, really getting excited about this um, because it's, it's all about numbers. So yeah, that's coming up. Um, but enough of that, let's actually get into the project. Um, what we're going to be doing right now is we're going to take the piece for the sides, eight foot, uh, eight foot long, four foot long, and we're going to cut the sucker in half. Now, there are a lot of, my tape measure is gone. Hmm, there's a tape measure down here. Uh, there, there are a lot of people who will uh, be very picky about what half is. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the board and say, mm, yeah, it's slightly longer than four foot. So I'm going to make a mark here at two foot and I'm going to cut one piece and then make the other one match it. So let's actually zoom in on this so you can see what I'm doing. Now the reason I'm thinking about switching away from alder is that it is like this bright white that just does not show up well on camera. So I'm thinking about changing it to oak. Um, as to wood choices... Surprise! Yeah, yeah, surprise, surprise. As to wood choices, I mean, it really doesn't matter. Alder is easier to work with. It's not going to last quite as long. It dings up and dulls uh, and, and, and dents, but oh well, it's a tool that's designed to be carried around. Um, oak is a good one, maple is a good one, cherry, walnut, if you want to get special, you could make um, out of different woods. Uh, you'll also notice as I went around this, I was referencing off of this edge, then I rolled it and I was referencing off of this face, and I rolled it and at this point I flipped the square over so I can keep referencing off of this edge. And then as I roll it again, I'm still referencing off of this face. So I'm always keeping the reference of the square on the same edge and the same face so I get the line wrapping all the way around. Now let's go to cut this up. Um, I could pull out my bench hook, but I am one of these weird people who like to saw in the vise. For something like this, the bench hook would probably be a little bit faster. But okay, I, have a I am a... Related. Okay, what's that? Foreman asks, I have a bunch of pallet wood lying around. How is that? Booyah! Pallet wood is one of the best types of trees out there. Um, yeah, I, one of the things I want to say about this project is I've, I've made plans for this, but feel free to change it however you want. I, I a lot of people want to make one of the two sides, rather than making them both angle, make one of them straight. So when you carry it beside you, you have a flat edge on your leg. Um, a lot of people don't like the divider. A lot of people want to move the divider around. I've tried to make this as flexible as possible. So you can make it longer, you can make it shorter. Mm, excuse me. Um, there's a lot of changes on this. And if you don't want to do any particular step on this, then no problem. Um, some people actually want to make the ends uh, taller, in which case you just need to get something bigger than a one by six. So if you get a one by eight or a one by 10, uh, that way your sides can be taller and you don't have to bend the handle. It can just go straight across. But I like bending the handle. And that's one of the things I wanted to show. So, um, let us go into this. Okay, I've gotten a couple of questions. Cool, what's that? Let me set this so, up. So, Nicholas Espirito asked, are you worried that oak would be too heavy? No. Oak really isn't that heavy, um, surprisingly. It's, did I measure from this end or that end? Making sure I get my board right. Measured that end. Um, oak is, is not that heavy, but it depends on personality. Um, I know a lot of people are going to make this out of simple pine. 
That's really nice and light. Alder is also fairly light. So if that's something you're worried about, then yeah, think about that. Now when I'm cutting down, I'm going to be starting across the top, and then I'm going to be cutting down an angle this way. And I want to cut from this corner to the bottom side in this corner. And the reason I'm doing that is because I can see this line, and I can see this line. And so if I cut down an angle all the way across, I know I'm perfectly on my line there. Then I can rotate the board over, and I can do the process again, and I can make those lines match up. And all the way along this cut, I'm always just cutting on the section that I start on. So I'm going to start it on the far side, and I'm going to slowly drop my heel until I come back across that line. Now I've developed the cut all the way across the board, and I'm going to drop the heel further, watching the line on my side, until we connect from one side to the other. And I've got a really nice clean edge all the way across there that is then perfectly square this way, perfectly square this way. Oof, I like that. No cleanup needed because I watched and stayed on the line all the way around. Now here's the thing. I measured this one to be two foot long. And my board was slightly longer than four foot. So I've got a little wisp off of here that these are different. Now I can draw a line and cut this again, or I could use these, uh, use a, a plane and plane it down to thickness. I'm probably going to cut it again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to line up these two boards, and make sure they're nice and smooth on the back end. Now one of the things I probably should have done was checked the factory cut to make sure this was nice and square, um, and if not, true it up. But in this case. I actually got lucky. It is nice and square. <laughs> well, I think that answered Brian Ross's question because he asked how come you didn't check to see if the sides were Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have checked it. it ahead of time. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to line up these, make sure they're nice and flush across there. And then I'm going to grab my knife and I'll put one little nick here. And then I can use that to do the exact same method. Draw it around here. Now, if I really wanted to be funky, I could try and cut the board exactly in half, so I just have to do one cut. But why take yourself out of the enjoyment of cutting uh, an extra cut? And I love it when that line going all the way around starts back on here. I've had a lot of people ask me why I don't actually use a knife line, because I could come back in with a knife and create that little line across there. I just find it, it's, it's one more step and it doesn't help me that much. When I was first getting started, it was really nice because it would hold the saw in place and would keep it from moving around. But once you get used to it, it's, it's just an extra step and you don't really need it to hold the saw in place. Now, I'm not gonna waste your time because it's just cutting that. I'm gonna do that later off camera. Uh, there'll be a few other things, but well, actually, let me show you because some people are gonna be worried about how do you start it so close to the edge. And let me flip this around so I can show you on this side. Set it in here. Yeah, if there are any questions, go ahead and stop me. Questions about what we're actually working on. Now, with this one, I've got about an eighth of an inch, which is nice because my saw blade is less than a sixteenth of an inch. And I'm just going to pinch it here, and I'll let the saw slide along my thumb. And just like the video I had recently showing how to start a saw, I'm going to let it balance between my finger here and the back of my wrist. So the whole thing is just wobbly in my hand. And I'm going to hold it off the wood, just let it nick until it starts. And once I get that kerf in there, it's the exact same thing going all the way across the board. Just like that. So don't overthink it too much. The biggest thing is the control. Don't force the saw. Don't put your weight behind the saw. Let it be loose in your hand, and then let it guide with this hand. This hand can push it side to side, make it, letting it go right on the line. And so I can let it slide on that, put a little bit of force just against my thumb to hold it, and lift it off the plate so that there's no weight on the saw. You're actually just cutting right above the saw. So you can slide it on your finger and just barely nick across. That's what you're looking for. 
I have a question. What's up? Brian Ross wants to know, what saw are you using for the cuts, James? This is a carcass saw, um, a Veritas carcass saw. Uh, it is a cross-cut saw. A carcass saw is a cross-cut saw, um, although Veritas sells their carcass saw in a rip saw configuration, which really confuses people. Um, but yes, cross-cut, small back saw, um, is a carcass saw, carcass saw. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to figure out what angle are we going to put these sides at. And this is going to scare a few people, but it doesn't matter what angle it's at. There's, there's no best angle. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, when, when I made this one, I put this on here and I went, okay, uh, that's 90 degrees and I want it to be at... Uh, Let's do that angle. That looks about right. Uh, that, that looks like a good angle to me. Yeah, right there. Let's do that. Now, in the plans, I have specific angle on here. Let's just see how close I might do this. Wow, I'm actually pretty close. Huh, cool. But I'm going to do it by this angle. Um, because it really, really doesn't matter what angle you put it at, as long as it's something around that. You, I mean, 45 is a long way out there. And 90 is flat up and down, so something around there. <laughs> that, I, know, I don't know why that, that, that tends to scare some people when you kind of drift away from the plans a little bit. Um, but we'll be talking about why it doesn't matter because um, the way I like to build things is I like to make them and then adjust to reality. So whatever we do to this, we will just adjust it on the next piece. Um, and that's why I don't do like the massive cut list where everything is cut to shape ahead of time and then I fit it together. Now I build one piece and then I make the next piece match that one and then I make the next piece match that one. And that way, if you do have any drift over time, you can fix it. If you cut everything ahead of time and there's a little bit of drift, well, you already cut it and you kind of up a creek without a paddle. So then what we need to do is we need to put an angle along the bottom edge of this. So if this is the side of the, uh, of the box, it's leaning out, we need to actually cut off this bottom corner and slice it off. So to do that, we need to know what angle are we cutting off. So we have this bevel gauge we just set that angle at, and we can mark it. Let me move this over so you guys can see a little bit better. One of these days, I'm going to hire a videographer to come in here and shoot these for me. So right now, you see, yep, this end, let me do it this end. Right now, because I haven't decided which end of the board I'm using, is it this end or this end, it really doesn't matter. I'm just going to put this on here and I'm going to mark this angle. I'm going to put one, whoop, move over. I'm going to put one point right on the corner here and the other point back a little bit. It's hard to do this to hold it in place for the camera to see. Lock that down. Here, put it down here. There we go, lock that down and then I'm going to mark it. Just like that. So that is the angle I have this particular one flaring at. Now the important thing here is the distance because this side of the line is right on that corner and this side of the line is down a little ways and we want to find out what that is. So I'm going to grab a marking gauge and I'm going to set this on here and I'm going to put the pin right in that line, slide the fence down Again, this is really hard to do with the camera right here. And then lock it down. You go just a little bit more. A little bit more. Right there. And now I have a line that is the same point here. And I need a little bit more actually. There we go. And now we can run this all the way across the board transfer that mark to the other side. So what we want to do now is remove everything down to that line. Now I'm not making this angle mark here on the other end because it really doesn't matter. I'm going to put that here in the device. And what we want to do is plane this down at that angle. Now I could grab my regular bench plane and just hold it at that angle and slowly get down to that depth, or 
I could grab my scrub plane, which is hiding on me. Oh, it's over here. Just a moment. I can grab my scrub plane, which just makes things go a little bit faster. I can set that on here, hold it close to the angle. And all I'm looking at is I'm making sure that I'm not getting close to either line. I'm just making sure I'm jamming up my plane because that's a very important thing to do. Let it run off the end. I got a big chunk, big chunk stuck in there. So my grain's going the opposite direction, so I'm actually gonna pull it. I would push it, otherwise the camera's on that side. Just gonna hold it close to that angle. Grab my microphone cable. Actually, this one kind of arches. So from this point to this point, I'm going one direction. Back this up a little bit. So if I play in this way, I'm going with the grain. And then I play in this way to go with the grain over there. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go with the grain and then be very careful not to chip out there. So what I'm doing is I'm watching the corner here and I'm watching that line I drew and I'm not gonna touch either of those. I'm gonna stay away from them as long as I can and just get it close to both lines. Taking light pass after light pass. I have my scrub plane James. actually set pretty light. Are you? Oh, I'm not on that camera, sorry. Two, there we go. So we're just going to work across this. The grain on this one is actually a bit more wild than I normally like, especially for alder. You don't expect that in alder. Okay, so we're about an eighth of an inch away here, about a sixteenth, 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 sixteenth. I'm gonna get a little bit closer to this corner here. On top, we got about an eighth inch away, all the way along to about here. So I'm just staying away. I wanna bring it all into about a sixteenth inch away or so, because then I can bring in a regular plane, and now that I have this beveled fairly well, I can kind of match that angle. And the first pass or two is going to be a bit rough because I'm cleaning up all of the scars made by the scrub plane. And because this is diving grain, I'm going to plane from here to here, and then I'm going to turn around and plane from here to here. Because you don't always get perfect grain. Perfect grain is nice, but not necessary. Okay, we're good here to here, right on that line here. Just about on that corner. I'm gonna go a hair more here. There we go. There to there. Now let's do it from here to here. It's always good to learn to be able to pull the plane as well as push it. Because there's times when there's a camera in the way, you just gotta work around it. There we go. So now we can check this, take our bevel gauge, set it against here, slide it down. And that's what I'm looking like all the way along. If you see any spot you need to do a little bit more work on, you can just stop and detail it. But that one looks pretty good. So there's our bevel angle on there. Pretty simple, pretty easy. Um, I know for some reason a lot of people think that you have to cut that because there's a large meat there. We were taking off eh, a little over a quarter inch actually on this one. Um, so you don't have to do that. A good scrub plane can get you close to where you want to go very, very quickly. Um, so that is the sidewalls. And you're just going to do that again on the other one. But for right now, we want to work on these end caps. And these are where the fun comes out. Um, now with the end cap, you have to ask yourself, how wide do you want this box to be? And what I have in the plans is about the maximum size, the width that can be with using this one piece to create both the end caps and the bottom and the divider as well. Because what we're going to end up doing is we're going to take half of this board and we're going to turn that half into the bottom. We're going to resaw this down, take those two halves, put them together and make the bottom cut off a piece of it to make the divider. 
So if we make the sides too long, then one side, two side, we're going to be eating into the space we need for a bottom. So you want to make sure your side is about right, which I have in the plans is what I have on here. Um, they get you pretty close. Um, oh, shoot. I didn't, didn't pull out the plans. I should have done that. But the first thing we want to do is we want to grab this. plan ahead. I did not plan ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there is a dad joke just for you. <laughs> so we have this bevel gauge that was set up. And we want to keep this together because we're going to use it a few other times. The first thing we want to do is mark off one end for where this is actually going to fit on this. So let's move back to this one. So on here, I'm going to slide this down here. And we're actually going to bring this over here. What we can do is set this in place, put the, the bevel on the bottom, flush at the bottom here, and bring it up into here so the corner touches there. I'm going to mark right on the other side here. And then I'm going to mark right here. I just want to know where the end of this board is um, on here, if that makes sense. So we're lining up. This is the, the side we just planed, turning that flat to the bottom. So this corner just touches the outside of the board. And this will let us know the maximum edge, bring this back over here, to where this needs to be. Now I can bring this bevel gauge over here, and I can set the bevel gauge right on that mark and draw my line. And that way I know that this angle is not the same as that one, is it? Oh, yeah, it is. Okay, never mind. Just looks slightly different to me. Um, I know this angle is the same angle as this because I use that to mark it. And now that I have this angle on here, we can then figure out how wide does our bottom need to be. And so in this case, I'm going to make it, how big did I make it on this one? I'm going to make it eight and a half inches wide. That was my original one. I think the plans, I designed it with a little bit longer. So we're going to come out here to eight and a half inches. It really doesn't matter that much. I'm going to put this nick on here, then take the bevel gauge, flip it over, move this in a little closer for you. Ah, my microphone keeps catching. Move that back. Yeah, it is impossible to focus on alder. So we've got this end here with a line here the line there. Then we have our mark out here at eight and a half inches. We can put this bevel gauge on here, slide it back, and we can draw this line here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to cut all the way across this board, and this is one end cap, and we're going to make the next one right beside it, but we're going to flip it. So this is the bottom edge of the box, and then on this end cap, this is the bottom edge of the box so that we can use this one cut to make both sides. But my bevel gauge isn't long enough to reach all the way across, so I can flip it over, bring it over here, set this in, and then continue the line all the way across the board. So now we need to cut these. And this gets really, really confusing for some people um, because it's an angle. And, oh no, what happens when we want to cut an angle? Well, an angle is only an angle if you turn. Uh, excuse me, an angle is only an angle if the board turns. If you turn, now, now it's straight. So we're just going to cut a straight line just like we normally would. I could put this in a bench, uh, in a uh, bench hook. My brain is fried right now. But again, I like to use a vise. So I'm going to do this for like the next 10 minutes to open this up to five and a half inches across. I really need to get a quick acting vice one of these days. Oh, did Alan super chat? Did yeah, I see? Because I had an awesome <laughs> joke. She usually does. I think I opened it up too much now. I got excited. Yeah, overexcited. How about a question that's not related? Sure. I clamp this down. Um, Darth Three wants to know when are you bringing the tool sale to Saskatoon? <laughs> um, Hand Tool Rescue is actually talking about sponsoring one or, or starting one there, so uh, maybe I might have to get up there again. 
Only this time I think I'll fly. Okay, but we just discovered that Saskatoon berries make the best jam, preserve, oh, whatever yeah. it was. Saskatoon berries are really good. Oh my goodness, like I would buy a whole crate of that stuff. It's amazing. <laughs> Okay, so let's move back over to this. So what I've done is we have our line across here, which you're not going to be able to see because this is alder. Another reason why I might switch to oak for next week. And then I'm going to draw down the face. So I'm just going to put my knife right into that mark. Draw down the face. And we've got our edge there. Now, got to grab my saw. Now what I'm going to do is the exact same thing I would have normally done rather than cutting across the board this way. I'm going to turn myself to be over here. I'm going to pinch the board here and let my slaw ride against my thumbnail. So just to start the nick, lifting the saw up, and then slowly follow that line across the board. So as I'm cutting in, I've cut about three quarters of an inch in the board right now. I'm just going to watch that leading edge of the saw as it slowly makes its way all the way across the board. Let me zoom in a little bit to show you. So this. Brian Ross wants to know what side of the line do you cut for this angled cut? Um, for this one, well here, let me back up here. So this is the piece that I'm working on. This is the first one. So I'm going to make this little cut here and I'm going to make this little cut here. So I'm cutting on the outsides here. And then I'm going to take this piece, I'm going to flip it upside down and mark my other one here. So I'm cutting on the outside of this box. Uh, so this, this piece that we're making here, I'm cutting on the outsides of that line. Let me go back to this. Show you how I can follow this across the board. Kind of. Hopefully you'll be able to see this. But with Alder, not holding my breath. So, starting the outside of the line, I'm going in and I'm just going to let the first tooth contacting here, I'm going to let it slowly come back across here. Blowing out the dust. So now I'm back to about here. And now I'm nicking here and there. Now I'm developed all the way across with a nice straight cut. And so from this point, I'm looking at this line that I drew back over here to make sure that I'm vertical. I want to make sure my cut is up and down. And that's going to let me keep my saw turned side to side, eyeballing that line I drew. And again, I'm going to draw a line from the far side here to the underside here. So I'm only cutting on the line that I see. I'm not cutting against the line that I don't see. The other thing you're going to run into a problem with a wide cut like this is anytime you do a wide cut, if my saw only moves from here to here, then there's a chunk of the blade that is always inside the cut. And that chunk of the blade never loses the sawdust that's filled up in here. You need to make sure that at one point of the cut, there's always some of the blade that's out. So I'm going to cut with my tip all the way back in here, and I'm going to cut all the way until my heel is back in here. So I make sure that this area that's out of the wood will then come back past here so that there's always a piece that comes out both on the front and back of the board. This way I make sure I'm completely discharging the sawdust on both sides. If I stop halfway and I have a chunk of the blade that never gets out of the wood, then it's just going to be loading up with sawdust and that's going to be pushing the blade one way or the other because the sawdust is trying to get out of there. The only way it can get out is to come up through the crack and that will push the saw plate to one side or the other as the dust comes up. Now with this one I could flip the board over but I do exactly what I did before but in this case I trust myself enough with a nice stable cut on there, I'm just going to cut all the way across. I'm cut. All I have is that little bit here, and I pulled the blade back far enough that the saw actually fell all the way through. There we go. And we can just test to see. Nice and flat. All the way across. Makes me happy. And then we can bring this over and see exactly how it comes out on there. Ooh, that's pretty. Now, now if I was really smart, what I would have done 
is cut this little piece off here before cutting the board because it was all held together. But I got excited about this long cut. Oops, so now what I'm gonna do is take this out, move this over, and we're gonna cut this little piece here exactly the same way. Start it, let the line come back across the board. like that. Put that over there out of the way. Back over to one. So now what we have is this weird shaped board. Uh, now when I made the first one, I left these top corners odd because uh, I didn't know exactly what I wanted the angle on this top to be. I ended up choosing to make those tops at 45 just to clean them out. Um, and I would generally suggest leave those alone until you start cutting your dovetails because your dovetails may actually end up needing a little bit more space up here. Um, so hold off on these uh, and cutting these off until later. But what we can do is now use this end to put it back on here and we can redraw out the other one. And this is one of the things that I love to do is because if for some reason oh no, I accidentally cut on the wrong side of the line on the first one. Well, then I might run into the problem if one board is this long on the end and the other board is this long on the end, then my two sides are going to be a trapezoid growing out away from each other. But if I did make a mistake on the first one, I can lay it on here. And if there is a mistake, oh well, both ends are going to be the exact same size. So they will work. And that's the only thing that matters. So we can put them on here. Make sure everything is nice and flush, copathetic. And I can draw my line on this. If I really wanted to, I could come in here with the square or the, the bevel gauge and make sure it is exactly what it should be, which it should be. Hey, look at that. We're happy. And then we can put it in here and do the exact same thing over again. I'm going to spare you that for right now. What time is it? 40. Okay, cool. We're, we're doing really good for tonight. Um, so I'm going to cut this later off the video, but it's the, basically the exact same thing we're doing here, except for one piece is going to have this square corner, and the other piece is going to have this sharp corner on both sides, which doesn't matter because we're going to be cutting those off later just to make them a little bit more um, well, nice looking. Uh, let me make sure that I didn't do that. Yeah, perfect. And so what you should end up with this the only scraps you end up with this whole project are the four corners from this, one, two, three, four. And then we're going to cut this at a little bit less than 24 inches. So you'll have another pie piece right here from where you cut this off to right here. You'll have another little chunk here that is scrap. So from this whole project with the two boards, you're just going to have those five little pieces of scrap, which I kind of like being economical that way. Although, not everyone likes that as much as I do. Um, any questions before I move on? Um, you may have answered this in your talking while I was trying to look at the chat, but Kylie had asked, to add to Brian's question, do you have a preference on cutting the line, a.k.a. waist side, split it? Did you talk about that? Um, yeah, I, I cut, on because I'm, because I'm shaping this particular board, I've laid out what I want from this board, so I'm going to cut on the outsides of the line to make sure I keep this board. Uh, that's, the, that's the big thing about using a marking knife as opposed to using a pencil. When you actually cut the fibers with a marking knife, you're saying this is where the cut needs to be. Everything on one side of the cut you keep, everything on the other side of the cut you get rid of. The other nice thing with a marking knife is it severs all the fibers. Um, let me actually show you on this one. Um, is with the... Hey, focus, 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 focus. There we go. Look at that. That's happy. Uh, so here, this edge here, I cut with the marking knife first to lay out my line. And I cut right alongside that line. So I've got a really nice clean edge here because all the outside fibers are cut with a knife. On the other side of the board, I didn't cut it with a knife. This is just where the saw busted through. And we have all of these fibers breaking off over here. So if I really wanted a perfectly clean cut all the way around the board, 
I would have used a marking knife all the way around all four sides and then cut right beside that marking line, marking line and that way I'd have a really crisp edge all the way around the board. I don't care about that too much because we're going to be working on this, so this little bit of chip out is not a, uh, is not a problem. But yes, that is one of the, the great wonders of a marking knife as opposed to a pencil, is it does some of the cutting for you as well as it is a very, very accurate mark. Everything on this side of the line you keep, everything on this side of the line you get rid of. Um, it's just, a, it's an infinitely accurate mark. Whereas with a pencil you have the outside of the line, the inside of the line, the outside, the other side of the line. Um, it's just, it's a little bit vague. I mean, you can always get a finer pencil, but there's always a line that you're never quite sure which side you're going off of. So, cool. We had a super chat, was it? Yeah, it said pi. Pi? I don't know. 3.14? You gonna go farther? No. <laughs> I used to have it memorized a long ways. Okay, um, Where's your dad joke? You got a dad joke? No, I have I don't have one off the top of my head. You'll find uh, one. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm hanging. Um, so the next thing we want to do... You don't even let me. Sorry, go for it. Okay. I just adopted a dog from a blacksmith. As soon as we got home, he made a bolt for the door. Nice one. <laughs> um, so the next thing I want to do is actually create the grooves for the bottom to fit into. Uh, I was originally thinking I wouldn't create the grooves for this until later. And this is one of these things, you can do that just about any time before you actually put the bottom into slot. Uh, but in this case, it is going to make it a little bit easier so that you're not messing up um, having the, uh, the, the dovetails because you want to have the groove coming out here. On my first, on the, uh, my... Um, Demonstration here. Let me switch over to two. I have a question before you get too deep in that. Yeah, just a moment. Let me finish that. On my, my demonstration, I was gonna was planning on having the groove coming out here so you could see it on the end. I always like leaving the groove open. Um, you can fill it, and I'll be talking about that later. Um, but in this case, I made the groove a little bit too low and actually ran into the tails here. And so there's a little missing piece here. Um, so I'm thinking this time we're gonna cut the groove first to make sure we put our tails away from that groove uh, and we don't run into that problem. One of these things that I learned afterwards and be like, oh, I didn't really think that one all the way through. <laughs> okay, um, so for this, I'm going to be Can using... I ask my question? What's that? Well, Laura M. once said, I missed something. Why did you cut the one corner off? Why did I cut the one corner off? Oh, this corner um, wasn't cut off. That's the end of the board um, because I don't need any longer than that because eventually we're going to be cutting this off at a 45 degree angle. So this corner will disappear. Um, so we don't need to move it far to the board to make both ends this way. So this is the end of the board. So, yeah. Um, so the easiest way to cut a groove is with a grooving plane. And here I have my Stanley 45. It is set up with a quarter inch cutter. Now, if you don't have a Stanley 45 or a plow plane or something like that, you can make a grooving plane relatively easily. I made this when I first got started with hand tools. It took me like three or four hours. Um, I made it out of a piece of firewood in the backyard. I actually have a video on that if you wanna see. And then I, I think I have like two or three videos on making a grooving plane. They're a little older, um, but they go through it step by step if you wanna see that. And so you can make your own grooving plane with an old chisel, with an open face like this. And all it is is shaped like this. You have where the groove will be and the space coming in. So this is a quarter inch by quarter inch by quarter inch groove. It's a quarter inch wide, a quarter inch deep, a quarter inch away from the outside. And just makes it really quick and easy. And so I'm gonna do one of them with this and one of them with a the plow plane so you can see that. But the, the biggest problem is how do you actually hold on to these? And my bench, as is normal, starts to get cluttered. So I have to take a moment to clear things out of the way. I don't want to be knocking planes off. Normally, I take a breath and I breathe and I hang some planes up. But since you're all waiting on me, I haven't done that. Um, let's actually start with the sidewall. Now the problem is this sidewall isn't vertical, it's leaning over to the side. 
but we want our groove to be flat to the bottom. So that means our groove actually has to be angled in. And that, that again, just scares a lot of people. Once you start thinking about, oh no, I have to make an angled groove, and you have to realize the groove's not angled, your mind is angled. Oh wait, that's why I tell my kids. <laughs> the groove really isn't angled. so cute. What? That's why they're so acute. Yes, they're so cute. <laughs> um, it's just a groove. It's the exact same groove you would make either, either way. I'm just going to be doing it with a plow plane. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it here on the edge of my bench. Switch over to this one. Switch over to this one. Hey, there it goes. I'm going to put it over here on the edge of my bench and have the board overhang the side a little ways. I have two dogs here to pinch it between. Uh, my dogs are all about an inch and a half away uh, from the edge. I like that measurement, though sometimes I wish they were a little bit closer to the edge. And I'm going to pinch it in here. And so this whole thing, there we go. Yep. Where are you wiggling? Just wiggling that way. There we go. Now it's locked in place and this won't move around. Now the problem is, we're thinking about running the grooving plane this way, but we need to actually move it this way. Can you see if you can focus it just a little bit more? There, is that better? Yeah, a little bit. Here, I'm actually going to move the... Hey, let's see if I can move it around here. My cord is short. Hi. Okay, right, let's see if we can get it this way without unplugging things. Hey, that's a little better. Now, if I can do it without actually unplugging this. A little bit more, there we go. So, what we want is we don't want it straight like this. We want it to actually match the bottom. And so I'm gonna actually feel, I'm gonna put my fingertips right here on the bottom, and I'm gonna feel it when the fence tips over and touches the side. And that's the angle I want. And, oh my George, it's set up to make a groove at an angle. Look at that! We're grooving at an angle, and that's really all it is, is just tip the plane over and cut your groove. And, oh, happy curls. That is, is all it is to it. And once you get it started, it locks itself in place. And you see how the plane just holds itself there. You're just making sure that your fence is at the angle and is flat up against the side here. Just as if I were on this side of the board, I make sure my, my fence is flat up against the side. On this side of the board, I'm just making sure the fence is flat up against the side. It just happens to be at a different angle than the face. And so with this, just keep going until we get down to depth. Oh, I love these curls. Any questions while I'm doing this? Oh, I'm not wearing my t-shirt. My mom just gave me uh, a, uh, a shirt for Christmas. Uh, happy Little Wood Curls. That was, uh, what that was, 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 was it Happy Little Accidents or Happy, happy Little Accidents? <laughs> uh, I love this. Let me just zoom out and show you these. This is one of my favorite things. Uh, this, this is actually the reason I got into hand tool woodworking, is a grooving plane. It is just so easy and simple. I watched, um, I watched uh, um, Worth the Effort. He made one in, uh, in his shop with all hand tools. And I was like, oh wow, if he can do that, I can do that. And with that began uh, Wood by Wright. Now one of the problems I'm gonna have with this one is this is set up for a quarter inch by quarter inch by quarter inch groove, which is great if I'm going here. And right now I'm actually at depth. But the problem is my groove is a quarter inch from this outside corner to the inside here. And that means I only have, what, a little more than a 16th inch on the top edge. So if I were actually making a grooving plane for this, I would make this gullet a bit deeper. I'd probably make it, uh, what? an eighth inch deeper, maybe a little bit more than that deeper. Um, the nice thing about this gullet is right now it's set up so if I'm doing something that's straight, I get a groove that I know is a quarter inch deep. 
But if I'm making a groove for this one, I'm going to want to make it a little bit deeper on here. On this one, with the uh, Stanley 45, I can actually adjust the fence. Oops, my sp Oop, there it is. I can adjust. Ah! Phillips. I hate Phillips. <laughs> so we can loosen this up. And then I can adjust the fence to set my depth stop to whatever I want. In this case, I'm going to make it a bit deeper than I need. Lock this in place. And there is no specific amazing depth that this groove needs to be. It just needs to be that deep. Also, in this one, I didn't set the fence because I wasn't sure I want to make this one match whatever I did with that one. So in this case, I'm just going to put it into that slot. And I'm going to slide my fence up. Once I loosen it, slide my fence up. Oh shoot, this is the 45 that's tight. Takes a bit more work to move. I have one 45 that's really nice like and one that's tight. That Sorry, I'm full of it. Oh, she's, she's on a move tonight. So I can actually set this up to match, tighten down the fence. And a lot of times that's actually the way I'm going to do it, is I set up the cutter and the skis, and I want the cutter to be sticking out just a shaving thickness higher than the two skis. I want those two skis to be perfectly parallel with a 45 is nice because they're always parallel. And so if I were doing it flat on an edge, I would actually mark out where I want my groove to be. I want my groove to be from here to here. And then I'd set the ski right onto those marks and then adjust the fence up to match it. But in this case, because I already have a groove running here, do this one. Now I can keep going deeper this way, but my vice is in the way. And again, with this one, all I'm doing is holding this fence up against that angle, letting it slide along that face that we made earlier. This one's cutting a little bit deeper. But with this one, almost to depth here. A couple more passes. There. Now, we've got ourselves a groove there. And this is like uh, Wood by Wright's new groove. I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's, that's that. Uh, it's really, don't overthink it. You're, you're just making a groove that is parallel with this play face that we planed off earlier. It just happens to be at a different angle from this face here. Now the next question then comes with this board. We want to do a quarter inch groove all the way across here. Um, and how do I make sure that this groove matches up and is the same distance in from this one? Because this one is an angle. Isn't that going to be different? No, because you are measuring off of this face for how far in your groove is, when you measure off of this face for how far in your groove is, it's the exact same thing right here. Because this face is the same as this face on here. So when we put the fence, so when we put the fence on here and we register the fence off the bottom, we're doing the exact same thing we just did on this board. So with all the settings still set up on this, we can then go into cutting our groove on this board. Uh, the only problem is this one is at a, a weird angle so it makes it a little bit more difficult to clamp. So there's a couple different options for that and one of my favorites is just to do it on the horizontal because I like the look on people's faces when they see me planing like that. Let me show you what I'm talking about that. What time are we at? 54? Okay this will be the last thing we have today. So if there's any particular questions right now, my camera's falling. So I have one question. Brian Franklin asks, is there any reason you couldn't use a 5 16th cutter that or is that or a 7 16th? Um, well, the, the, the problem is the thickness of your board. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a 3 quarter inch board and we're going to resaw it down to make the bottom. So if you have 3 quarter inch and 3 quarter inch, you're going to end up with a 3 eight, uh, with a 3 eighths? Yeah, 3 eighths. Um, wall. So what you could end up doing is making, well, 3 eighths minus your saw kerf, which is around a sixteenth of an inch, and then you start getting into English math, which is dumb. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, um, so you're, you're going to end up being slightly thinner than three sixteenths um, walls. And so what I do is I cut it at a quarter inch. So that gives me a sixteenth inch of leeway that I can play back and forth with and I can plane it off. Um, if you make it if you make it slightly thinner, that's not a problem. You can you can wiggle that out. If it's slightly wider, that's not a problem. You can wiggle that out. As long as it's not bigger than three sixteenths, you should be okay. Um, and if it is a something a problem, you can hold off on cutting the grooves until you have your bottom done, and then you'll know exactly how much you have to play with. So um, to clamp this thing, because there are these weird angles, rather than laying it flat, I take it and I lift it up, and this means oh no. My plane can't go like this. My plane now has to go like this. Oh, well, let's see how that goes. So I'm going to set it on here, line up my fence, and oh, lo and behold, it works. And this is one of these things that just, the first time you see it, you're like, wait a second, there's something not right about that. Um, let me focus on this for you. There we go. But if you try it a few times and you get used to it, it is a great thing to have because sometimes boards are hard to hold on to, but if you put them vertical, you can almost always hold on to them. And just like that, we can cut a groove. Same thing with this. And I'm putting pressure down on the board, keeping that fence nice and level. Oh, this one's a slightly different setting. So it's got to thicken out. Oh, because this is a, um, my fence is ever so slightly away from it. There we go. So it's a little bit tighter on this one, but it's the exact same thing. I'm putting pressure down on the board, making sure my fence is referencing off of that surface. And just like that, we cut our groove. I don't know why groove cutting is one of those things I could go through boards all day long because these curls are just incredibly fun. Um, yeah. So um, that is what we have for the first step. We have our side walls. We have our end caps roughly cut. We have our grooves all the way around. And next time we're going to be getting together, we're going to be talking about dovetails. How do we actually dovetail at an angle? Ooh. Again, another scary thing. Um, but if you get the idea so far of it's really not an angle, it just happens to be parallel to a different surface. With dovetails, it's the exact same thing. It's not an angle, it just happens to be parallel to a slightly different surface. So stay tuned for next week and we'll be doing angled dovetails-ish. <laughs> so any questions before we wrap this up? So um, Dr. Connie Juma asked, how would you do an angled stop group? Um, okay, that's the next thing people are going to ask. What if I don't want this to go all the way through the end? And the thing is you chisel it. That's basically all there is. You take a quarter inch chisel and you chisel it out. And so you can use a chisel just like you would use, let me grab a scrap here. Um, just like you would use a plane, put it tip down. Let me just show you this. Right in there, two. <coughs> so, uh, mallet and chisel. Let's say I'm going to make my stop groove right here, wherever it's going to be. I'm going to put my stop on there. And I would mark out with lines where I want the width of it to be. I mean, obviously not that crude. I would use a marking gauge or something like that. But then I'd come in between those lines and plane. Oh my word, I need to sharpen this thing. Oh my, yeah, I'll work with it. And so I'd literally plane down, just like I'd have a plane, back it out a little bit more. And you slowly get a groove down to that stop. And every now and then you get this curl that doesn't come out. So you got to come in here and chop it down a little deeper and then back it out. And just keep going like that all the way back along the board. 
It's slow, it's long, and it's tedious, but you can actually do a stopped groove just by chiseling it out. Um, if your board is long enough, what you can do is you can chisel out a section for the front end of the ski to fall into, and then a section at the back for the back end of the ski to fall into, and then you can plane everything in between those two marks um, if it's long enough for that. But that's one of the reasons why I leave that hole in the end Rather than doing a stopped groove, I will focus on this. Um, I'll leave that hole in the end, and what we can do is we can actually plug it. And because it's end grain, it just disappears. Um, we'll be talking about that later. But personally, I like to leave the hole because I actually kind of like the look of it. But I'm weird. No comment from my wife? <laughs> what else we got? Um, well, there were a couple other questions that weren't necessarily related, so it's up to you. It's 902 if you want yeah, to Yeah, let's, let's save those for next time because we're working on this. Um, so next time, we're going to be doing dovetails. And if you do have any questions that I didn't get to, send me an email. I will try and answer as many of those as I can get to. So I hope you like this. Um, yeah, I think that's about it for today. And I'm looking forward to meeting a few of you at the Peach Meet in uh, the end of this month, beginning of next month. <laughs> you owe your mother-in-law a big hug or something. What's that? So you owe your mother-in-law a big hug or something. I do. She is the, the, the one who watches kids until Sarah gets home. So. Twice you've been gone on her birthday now. Oh, that's right. It's her birthday again. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll do it for today. <laughs> <laughs> until next time, have a wonderful day. Hang on. <laughs> I'm hanging. All right. Bye. <laughs>